Hello, I'm Don Carson. This is the fourth in a series of 14 talks surveying a lot of what the Bible is about. When people have lived under a decaying political regime characterized by increasing anarchy and its accompanying violence, unpredictability and injustice, what they begin to long for is structure, law and order, accountability, and the reliability of institutions made possible by wise legislation. Many centuries after Abraham died, his heirs, called Israelites, were constituted a small nation at the eastern end of the Mediterranean Sea. How God brought about this result, according to the Bible, is full of interest and surprise. But one huge part of these developments was the law that God laid down. In other words, God is presented not only as the creator, not only as the God who in mercy did not wipe out his rebels, but as the God who legislates. To be frank, many people today are repulsed by this depiction of God. Uh, surely, they say, this exposes any religion based on the Bible as a wretched straitjacket. God is in the miserable business of thundering, no, and thou shalt not, and spoiling all our fun. But for the next few minutes, I'm asking you to think hard about law in the Bible. You may begin to look at what God has commanded with new eyes. Last night, session one, the God who made everything. Session two, the God who did not wipe out rebels. Session three, the God who writes his own agreements with an introduction to what the Bible means by covenants. And this morning, the God who legislates. I suspect that one of the most common ob objections against Christians and against Christianity in the West today is that Christians are intrinsically narrow and bigoted. They hold that certain things are true and certain things are not true. They distinguish between heresy and orthodoxy. They have their own rules of conduct, of morality. Some things they approve and some things they disapprove. This is arrogant. It is divisive. Instead of building up civic community and establishing a genuinely tolerant society, it has the inevitable result of proving divisive. And for those who are brought up in some of the most uh, uh, of the strongest postmodern trends under the influence, let's say, of Michel Foucault, then all claims to speak the truth are really claims to power. They're forms of manipulation. Instead of fostering freedom, they merely engender constraint. And yet, when you look at the claims on the surface, they are problematic. No community is completely inclusive. Tim Keller in New York likes to give this example. Supposing you have a gay, lesbian, transgender committee working in some big city, working at inclusiveness. They get along pretty well together and they're trying to uh, strengthen their hand. And then let us suppose that one of their number comes to one of the committee meetings one day and says, um, you know, this is a bit embarrassing, but I've had this, this strange religious experience. I, I've, I've met this odd bunch of people, they, they're, they're Christians, and, and my whole life has been changed. I, I just don't view things the same way. I'm, I'm, I'm not convinced anymore that, 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 that homosexuality is merely an alternative lifestyle. And the others say to him, uh, well, we think that you're dead wrong on that, but, um, but you're welcome to your views. We, we still want to cherish you. And then as the weeks go by, the tensions build up because they're heading in different directions. They, 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 they have different values that they're espousing. Until eventually, the people on the committee say to this uh, committee member, you know, you, you really don't espouse our views anymore. You're, you're heading in another direction. Your, your perceptions of right and wrong are different from our perceptions of right and wrong. We're not sure that you belong in this committee anymore. We think that it would be a good thing for you to resign. They have just engaged in excommunication. 
Do, do, do you see, it is impossible to be completely, endlessly open because even that very endless openness is predicated on the assumption that that endless openness is a good thing. Such that if somebody then begins to say it's not a good thing to be endlessly open, they feel they have to reject that person precisely because they cannot be endlessly open to the person who does not have their view of being endlessly open. <laughs> in other words, in a finite world in any community, there are inevitably boundaries. There are inevitably inclusions and exclusions. Moreover, even appeal to truth is inevitable. In an earlier generation, often truth was analyzed to death under the rubric of psychiatry and psychology. That's changing again now. A generation ago, the popular lyricist Anna Russell took the mickey out of this uh, me generation with its uh, forms of uh, uh, explaining away all strange behavior. I went to a psychiatrist to be psychoanalyzed to find out why I killed the cat and blacked my husband's eyes. He laid me on a downy couch to see what he could find and here is what he dredged up from my subconscious mind. When I was one, my mummy hid my dolly in a trunk and so it follows naturally that I am always drunk. When I was two, I saw my father kiss the maid one day, and that is why I suffer now from kleptomania. At three, I had the feeling of ambivalence toward my brothers, and so it follows naturally. I poison all my lovers. But I am happy. Now I've learned the lesson this is taught, that everything I do that's wrong is someone else's fault. <laughs> that was a generation ago. Now we handle things just a wee bit differently. Uh, now we, we say that... Uh, Truth is shaped by community. Truth at the end of the day is, is merely what some particular group or individual perceives. What is true for you may not be true for me. But of course, if you hold that view, then you are holding that that perspective is true. At the end of the day, you simply cannot escape the notion of truth. Moreover, freedom cannot itself be endlessly open-ended. Would you like to be free to play the piano extremely well? Then inevitably you must learn a lot of discipline. That certain chords sound right and certain chords do not sound right. There are principles of the way music works. Do you want to be free to have a really, really excellent, trusting, joyous marriage? If you do, then you are not free to do certain things. In other words, an endless openness towards freedom becomes a kind of slavery. All of these things have to be borne in mind when we come to the Bible and discover that God here in the passages we're going to look at in this first session legislates. He prescribes rules. And unless we're willing to think outside of our own cultural Western box, we may find that somewhat offensive. Yet within the Bible's storyline, we, we discover that it's actually part of joyous freedom under the God who made us. Let me pick up on the Bible storyline from where we left off last night. Last night, we ended up with the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, having been called by God to constitute a kind of new humanity that would enter into a covenant relationship with him. 